Welcome, everybody. I am Dominique Valère and had the great pleasure to co-chair with Bob Baffman the Task Force on Treatment of Sarcoidosis, supported by ERS. The ERS Clinical Practice Guidelines on Treatment of Sarcoidosis that we present in this seminar with Bob and Peter, another member of the task force, had just been endorsed by the ERS Executive Committee and accepted for publication. There was no international guidelines on this topic since the statement on sarcoidosis in 1999. The mission of the task force was to update the guidelines concerning treatment, taking into account advances in knowledge on sarcoidosis with an accurate methodology. This work was made possible thanks to three important enabling conditions. First of all, the ERS support, which was essential all along the four years duration of the task force from 2017 to 2021. Second, the ERS team was always available and very professional rightly demanding when indispensable for delivering scientifically perfect documents. And third, the members of the task force team, including not only 14 experts, but also six methodologists, half from the ERS and three patients representative and also three librarians. As indicated, this webinar will be divided in uh, four parts. The main challenge of the task force was the matter. The main challenge of the task force was a matter of treatment of sarcoidosis, with only very few drugs approved anywhere, many drugs used use being off-label. Moreover, only very few studies on treatment met the best standards. Here, you can see a photograph taken in Lausanne at the ERS headquarters in the spring of 2017 with most members of the task force at its launching. Here is the list of the ERS clinicians of the task force. 10 were from Europe and four from the USA. I take the opportunity to thank every member of this team and especially my great friend, Bob Baffman, for his crucial involvement all along the work. Here you can see the list of the six methodologists. Their task was particularly difficult. I thank particularly Don Wellett, the last author of the article, and Peter Corsten, the third one. As you can see, the names of the patient uh, as you uh, also you can see the names of the patient representative. They were very motivated, and their role was very important. Two were from Europe and one from the USA. On this slide is represented the expected schedule at launching. There were different steps involving respective groups of the task force represented with different colors. For example, blue 
for the whole group and black for patients. Schematically, uh, for patients representative. Schematically, the first step was to establish p -calls. The second was to select articles, to extract data from them, and then to place them into Prisma. The third was grading PICO questions. The last one was to develop recommendations and to write the final report. The work took more time than expected and was achieved only in April 2021. But what is what PICO, uh, what does PICO mean? P is for population, I for intervention, C is for control, and O is for outcome. You can see tables with the eight selected, selected PICOs. The first column indicates the domain explored. For example, neurologic sarcoidosis. The second column is the population. The third column indicates the intervention, most often corticosteroids or immunosuppressive treatments. The fourth column indicates the two clinicians involved for respective PICOs. The fifth column indicates the methodologist involved for respective PICOs. And the sixth, the patient representative involved in each PICO. PICOs were developed for pulmonary, cutaneous, cardiac, neurologic diseases, as well as fatigue and small fiber neuropathy. Here you can see the PICO questions. The two first ones were for the lung. In patients with pulmonary sarcoidosis, should glucocorticoid treatment be used versus no immunosuppressive treatment? In patients with pulmonary sarcoidosis, should one add immunosuppressive treatment or remain on glucocorticoid treatment alone? And then two picos for skin. In patients with cutaneous sarcoidosis, should glucocorticoid treatment be used versus no immunosuppressive treatment. And in patients with, uh, with cutaneous sarcoidosis, should one add other immunosuppressive treatment with, when treatment with glucocorticosteroids has not been effective? And then you have other PICO for the heart, for cardiac sarcoidosis, for neurosarcoidosis, for fatigue, and small fiber neuropathy. Here you have the first page of uh, the paper, uh, which is accessible online. Uh, in conclusion, the ERS Task Force for Treatment of Sarcoidosis began in April 2017. Final approval of the tax force recommendation was made in April 2021. The tax force developed grade recommendations and comments regarding various aspects of sarcoidosis. Thank you. And now it's Bob. Dominic. Uh, my task is to, uh, is to summarize some of the statements that have been made uh, as a result of what Dominic has nicely described as the process that we went forward with. I think it's important to realize that this was an attempt to add scientific rigor to what has been um, an area that does have a lot of um, issues. Now, I do have some disclosures that are on this slide. They're very pharmaceutical companies that I've worked with. But I want to focus now, and none of that really had any impact on what the decisions that we've made. So PICOs 1 and 2, uh, this is a summary again that we looked at either corticosteroids or immunosuppressive for pulmonary disease. 
So if you think about treatment for sarcoidosis, we're going to talk mostly about anti-inflammatory therapy. And the first line of therapy being corticosteroids, that was a separate PICO from non-corticosteroid therapy, including the non-biologics, such as methotrexate and azathioprine, and for the biologics, such as infliximab, um, and repository corticosteroid open injection. So for PICO-1, which was Athel Wells and uh, Paolo Rotoli, um, in patients with uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis, should glucosteroids, glucocorticoid treatment be used versus no immunosuppressive therapy? So this is the process. Uh, PRISMA is a way of looking at um, identifying which articles should be used. It's a very formalized protocol. And uh, the methodologist assigned, in this case, Alexandra, um, went through all the different articles, the, met the uh, advisors on the committee, the clinicians also ident identified these articles. And then we came up with a total of 19 articles that were qualitatively analyzed. So we started with, you can see almost 2,000 articles, over 2,000 articles, and got down to this 19. This is just for use of corticosteroids in pulmonary sarcoidosis. Now, there was a general concept that has been involved over the last few years about treatment for patients with sarcoidosis, and it really goes along the line of the fact that there are two reasons to treat. One is danger, fear of death or significant morbidity, versus improvement in quality of life. And these actually have separate um, measures. If you ask patients, and well, one of the things that we did during the um, outcomes that we were looking at in the this task force, it became clear we didn't know what really outcomes the patients were felt were important. So the European Lung Foundation helped us by help doing this uh, survey of 1,804 sarcoidosis patients and subsequently published. And you can see that the most important um, information to the patient was quality of life. And imaging wasn't that important to them, but really they could care less about pulmonary function test results. Um, sorry for pulmonologists that realized that Patients really want to know how they feel. It's interesting that mortality and adverse events were not as important to the patients as their overall quality of life. And, but mortality is still something that we as clinicians get worried about, and especially for patients' potential getting worse. In the last few years, several papers have come out from different centers across the, the world looking at mortality predictors. Uh, this is Athel Wells Group in Great Britain. This is Dominic's group in France, and this is our group in the United States. And you can look at the presence of fibrosis, severe, um, moderately into severe um, obstruction and restriction, patients with evidence for pulmonary hypertension. And this Walsh composite score looks at both pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary fibrosis, and severe restrictive disease. And you can see that these all identified an increased risk for death at four to five times higher than those who do not have these factors. So we do have a way of identifying patients at risk for more severe disease. So this led to the first PICO, uh, the answer to the first PICO. And patients with pulmonary sarcoidosis, um, should corticosteroid be used versus no therapy at all? And the focus of the PICO was to look at patients who had major involvement from pulmonary sarcoidosis who were felt to be at higher risk for future mortality or permanent disability. So we felt that there was enough information from the literature to make a strong recommendation in this group because we felt, the group felt that patients with significant pulmonary disease at risk for mortality or permanent disability should be treated with glucocorticoid steroids as the first line of treatment uh, to improve or preserve pulmonary capacity and quality of life. So the second PICO then looked at patients who were on uh, corticosteroids, and the question was, should one add an immunosuppressive or remain on glucocorticosteroids alone? And this PICO was addressed by Dominic Valer and Elise Lauer, and they again looked at, using the PRISM, they went and identified a group of studies, a total of 1,300 studies that had been reported in this area, but they only really came up with six studies that were really uh, well identified and could be used to answer these PICOs. And what they came up with two recommendations uh, that met the grade criteria. For symptomatic pulmonary disease, 
patients at higher risk for morbidity and mortality, the same we just gave it as a criteria for patients treated with steroids, and if they had unacceptable side effects not from glucocorticoid or steroid or had worsening disease, the methotrexate could be considered as a conditional recommendation. Now, a strong recommendation is something we'd recommend um, for most patients. A conditional recommendation is something that the clinician can consider, and it's something if they want to use a different agent, that is okay. Or, but this is a recommendation of the committee. In the same way, the recommendations of the PICA uh, for patients who are on immunotherapy with glucocorticoid steroids with an immunosuppressive agent and continue to have disease, the addition of infliximab was another conditional recommendation. And the law quality of evidence here was still low, but it was probably one of the stronger recommendations based on evidence that we had. Now, these are grade recommendations. These are very specific criteria that have been developed over the years and across multiple different uh, areas, not only in pulmonary disease, but in other aspects of disease. So the grade recommendation is fairly formal. But we also felt that there had to be other treatments that have been used, and we had to make comments regarding this. And so what we, the committee looked at these comments about treatment, and they made general treatment options. And then a case by case, something beyond that, where in an individual case, you may want to still consider other options. These recommendations and comments were all up endorsed by the members of the committee and went through a process of uh, repeated voting so that we came up with a final algorithm, which I'm showing on this slide. So for pulmonary sarcoidosis, patients at low risk, that is no um, significant risk for improvement for impairment of their quality of life or mortality than observation. Those that have high risk for mortality, as we just went through, glucocorticoid steroids, that's a blue marker, that's a high risk, uh, strong recommendation. And then we go to in methotrexate, which is a conditional recommendation, very low evidence, or infliximab, conditional recommendation, low evidence. Better recommendation, better evidence, but these are similar weighted recommendations. Other drugs that you can see on here that some of you may be using, azathioprine, lefinamide, mycophenolate, these are comments that people have in the committee felt are reasonable alternatives, but not sufficient evidence to make them a strong recommendation. And rituximab, JAK2 inhibitors, and repository corticotra injections, these are recommendations that really should be made on a case-by-case -case basis for patients who have failed other recommendations on this algorithm. So what about recommendations beyond the lung? And there were six additional PICOs as introduced by Dominic. These included extra pulmonary disease, cardiac disease, neurologic disease, fatigue, and small fiber uh, neuropathy. And for pulmon extra pulmonary disease, we looked at both corticosteroids and for non-steroidal therapy, just like we did for pulmonary disease. When we went into this, we looked uh, through the prism at all extra pulmonary disease since sarcoid is a multi-organ disease. And we looked at specifically cardiac and neurologic, they had their own PICOs. But for other organ development, we looked at skin, eye, liver, and renal initially, but were unable to find sufficient information for any of these other organ involvement, except for under skin. Now, if we look at sarcoidosis, I've talked about morbidity and mortality, morbidity being impairment in quality of life and mortality truly being uh, an endpoint you want to avoid. And there are some organ involvements that um, we've already mentioned, pulmonary, cardiac, and neurologic. These have significant morbidity that skin, uh, I mean, the liver, kidney, and the eye, but really very low mortality. And unfortunately, there is very little data for these three groups at this time to make any specific comments. Whereas skin, um, there is significant morbidity that is cosmetically important skin lesions whereas there's no mortality from cutaneous involvement alone. So cardiac involvement, um, there were a couple strong recommendations. The, I, the International Heart Rhythm Society had already made a strong recommendation for patients with cardiac arrhythmias, be considered for a pacemaker and defibrillator, and we included that in our algorithm to remind people that that should be considered as a strong recommendation. For patients with clinically relevant cardiac sarcoidosis, that is symptomatic disease, then glucocorticoid steroids should be, was again a strong recommendation, although the information was fairly low. If the patients could also be considered for immunosuppressive therapy, either in addition to or as a replacement 
for corticosteroids. So some people in the committee use these as an additional upfront therapy. Others recommend using it only if you saw proof of corticoid toxicity. If you had good clinical response, then you could stop. But if you didn't, then you can consider other therapies, including infliximab and even cyclophosphamide has been reported. How about neurosarcoidosis? Now, in neurosarcoidosis, glucocorticosteroids remain still the first treatment. And if patients tolerate this and have no significant side effects, a strong recommendation is to stay with that. However, if those patients continue to have disease, they consider alternative therapies. Methotrexate and infliximab actually have enough evidence to support them as conditional recommendations, or these other ones were just comments from the committee. Again, the comments may be similar effectiveness, but the evidence to support the recommendations was based on the evidence in the literature. Of the other organ involvement, skin was the only one that was sufficient information in there. Again, a simple pass-through initial therapy with group of uh, topical steroids, then consider systemic steroids. And patients who had side effects then consider some of these alternative hydroxychloroquine, the anti-malarials are commonly used, but there's really not sufficient evidence. The only one with sufficient evidence to support were methotrexate and infliximab, where there have been randomized trials for use of these drugs for skin sarcoidosis. So I think that this again shows that there's evidence to support various aspects of anti-inflammatory therapy in sarcoidosis. We finished up with two other organ, uh, two other PICOs that we felt were important in the committee. The first was sarcoid-associated fatigue. And in fact, there is actually sufficient evidence to make a um, conditional recommendation with very good evidence to support initially consider exercise training or inspiratory muscle training or using a neurostimulants like this armadafinol or methylphenidate. Both of these have been shown to be better than placebo treatments for patients with sarcoid-associated fatigue. And patients who failed those and which other considerations such as low-dose corticosteroid or methotrexate. And then finally, was a, one of the um, more perplexing problems for uh, sarcoidosis is small fiber neuropathy. And I say more perplexing because at this point, we still have not identified in a good um, comprehensive therapy. And in fact, we could make no grade recommendations. Um, there was a feeling that for patients with mild non-disabling, you may want to just watch and wait, whereas those with severe uh, disabling, you want to treat with active granulomas inflammation first, and then consider other symptomatic treatments, including uh, drugs such as Topamax, GABA and, and analogs, and even an IVIG or TNF inhibitors to be considered. So at this point, I just want to conclude in the middle here that several studies have addressed the management of pulmonary extrapulmonary disease. We have now some evidence-based recommendations, and then we have some other comments. The next step of this webinar is for Peter Corson to help us apply how we would use these in individual cases. So I'm going to hand over the uh, directions to Peter. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Thank you, Dominique and Bob for this introductory uh, slides and uh, statements on the overall process. And I'm happy to present a couple of cases that we maybe use as example cases to uh, apply these recommendations to, um, to the clinical practice. So the first patient I want to present you is a 59 year old female patient that um, for the first time presented in May of 2018 to our Department of Nephrology and Rheumatology, actually, um, for skin sarcoidosis, which was histologically proven, but he had no other clinical symptoms. So um, I've prepared a couple of um, uh, questions for you. Um, we um, followed her up and screened her for pulmonary and other organ involvement. And what you see here is the pulmonary function testing with the force vital capacity of 84% um, of uh, normal and the uh, diffusion capacity of single breath of 71% in this patient. We performed a um, computed tomography of the test and, see, uh, and you see in the, in the right uh, lung and in the left lung slide infiltrates. These were proven to be consistent with sarcoidosis and um, uh, 
contained uh, granulomas. So she has asymptomatic pulmonary sarcoidosis, no coughing, no dyspnea, um, and um, she really suffered only from skin sarcoidosis on her upper back. So the first question I have for you, would you treat this patient for skin sarcoidosis, yes or no? You can use the poll that you just see and um, make your choice. Okay, we've seen 61% yes, 39% no. Bob, do you want to take it from there and discuss? Yeah, I think that it's important to realize that uh, the way you've set this up here is that the patient had no clinical symptoms. And uh, we struggle a lot in skin sarcoidosis about when to decide not to decide. And I like the terminology that uh, has been proposed, which is cosmetically important cutaneous lesions. So it's been pointed out that a little spot on your on the chin may not bother me, but may bother incredibly uh, a young uh, female, for example. Not to use a stereotype, but if you've got a lesion that's sitting there and you, you're bothered by it, then that's a cosmetically important lesion. As you presented this case with lesions on their back, which you said was not clinically important, so you one will presume that this patient did not have cosmetically important lesions, and I would not treat this patient for their skin lesions. Okay, I agree. And I remind you of the algorithm we post for sarcoidosis uh, that we need to assess the need for treatment, as you pointed out. The first step would be topical glucocorticoids, and this patient didn't have any cosmetically important lesions that bothered her, so we decided to not treat the patient. Next question is, we followed her up in September 2020, um, pulmonary function tests uh, uh, were again performed for smart capacity of 81% and uh, diffusion capacity of 73%. So basically unchanged pulmonary function testing, repeat chest CT, showed similar lesions, maybe slightly progressive lesions, but again, she had no pulmonary symptoms. So my next question is, would you treat this patient for pulmonary sarcoid, yes or no? The voting is still open. Make your choices. Okay, that's almost half and a half. Bob and Dominique, what's your take on this? Well, I'll start. Dominic, you can give your opinion. We haven't discussed this before, but I think that even though this patient has a progression of their chest x-ray, they really don't meet the criteria that I think of about increased morbidity and mortality since they don't really seem to have much fibrosis yet. You can make an argument that you're concerned that if you untreat it, it will go on to be fibrotic, but the study from the British Thoracic Society several years ago showed the patient with stage two, stage three, didn't necessarily get worse, and so you don't have to treat them. Dominic, what's your opinion regarding I, I, that? I agree with you, Bob. I agree with what you said. And there is a question for, for the, the third part of the, of the web. Uh, uh, at the end, there is a question on this topic. What is major pulmonary involvement? So uh, perhaps this question will be uh, considered later. Yeah. Okay, I show the algorithm for pulmonary sarcoid again. And um, I think we agree that this patient has rather low risk of um, progressive disease. And we decided in con conclusion in 
um, agreement with the patient to just observe because there were absolutely no clinical symptoms related to sarcoidosis or related to her pulmonary infiltrates. So we decided to know to not treat the patient for pulmonary sarcoid. I'm going to go to the next slide. And uh, recently I saw the patient again. She presented to her ophthalmologist. She was... Um, she had an appointment for a different condition on her eyes, and he identified um, posterior uveitis accidentally um, without any clinical symptoms. You know that posterior uveitis may be asymptomatic in sarcoidosis patients. So the more difficult question is now to treat the patient or not. We measure the uh, soluble IL-2 receptor, which um, has been increasing from the, the dates presented, May 18 to May 21, over three years. Um, you may discuss if this is useful biomarker or not, but there are some data indicating that it may be useful in patients with elevations. And um, now my final question that we didn't address in the, in the, in the task force report um, would be, how would you treat this patient at this point? because I think posterior uveitis is a condition that may necessitate treatment for permanent damage. So please choose your answer, ABC, glucocorticus alone, methotrexate, subcutaneously, adalimumab, subcutaneously, where there are data for uveitis. Okay, 91% um, choose glucocorticoids alone and um, around 10% additional immunosuppressive treatment. Um, what's your opinion, Bob and Dominique, on this patient? Well, I actually have strong feelings about this. We uh, published a series of nearly 400 patients with eye, with eye sarcoid. Um, and I think that they need to be, in particular, needs to be treated with systemic therapy. And, and Are you can get away with drops maybe, but posterior drops are not going to get there. And their alternative is an intraocular steroid injection, which patients don't find real comfortable. Uh, however, um, you don't necessarily need to place them on systemic corticosteroids. You may be able to control them as you wait for methotrexate to kick in. You, you've made methotrexate subcutaneous. I have to say that I still believe uh, it's oral. This is a reflection of you being a rheumatologist uh, versus us being, in my being a pulmonologist, and so we've used oral more than that. Um, our experience is that methotrexate works about 60 to 70% of the time in ocular disease, and so we don't necessarily have to go to an anti-TNF agent such as adilumab up front, but there are people who like that as an alternative, and it is approved, but it's not um, that much different than methotrexate, which I think still think is a safer drug. Yeah, I agree with this. Um... And in this case, the patient was treated with, um, um, I have to close this first, so, uh, with glucocorticoids alone. And she's now being tapered and we'll see if she's, um, how she's evolving. And then if she's uh, in need for additional treatment with methotrexate would be my first choice. Um, orally or subcutaneously, I have post this here because my preference in those over 50 milligrams per week is subcutaneously because patients tolerate it a little better, but um, orally is equally effective in those up to 50 milligrams. So this was the first case. I'd like to present the second case of a 46 year old female patient. She uh, was a soccer player and um, felt palpitations after a warm up for a soccer match in November of 2019. And this uh, has come to attention recently um, with these terrifying images of the, um, of the European, uh, of the European uh, Championship currently now taking place of the Danish soccer player Ericsson who collapsed and needed CPR during the match. And um, this really came into my mind and she was admitted to the hospital immediately. She didn't collapse, um, luckily, but she was found to have ventricular tachycardia. Um, and this uh, was a cardiac MRI, which showed dilation of the left ventricle with an ejection fraction of 35% in basal to mid ventricular akinesia and late gadolinium enhancement um, 
consistent with the diagnosis of myocarditis on the image and um, myocardial biopsy was performed and showed granulomatous inflammation consistent with the diagnosis of sarcoidosis. So um, the first question related to this case, what is, what are your next steps in treatment of this patient? A, glucocorticoids, B, antiarrhythmic drugs, C, placement of an ICD, D, methotrexate, or E, cyclophosphamide. Okay, so A, B, and C were the preferred choices, and um, I agree uh, with those choices. Any comments on that? Sure. I'm gonna I'm gonna show the the um, algorithm again if I'm able to do this here. So here it is. Well, actually, I'm a little concerned that only fifty nine percent said they put an ICD in. This should have been one hundred percent. Um, the patient with VTAC and with cardiac sarcoidosis, it's um, pretty convincing evidence that this patients are going to do much better if they have an ICD. We did, we published a study about two years ago, the Danish have had studies on it, the French showing that ICD really is a life-saving uh, effort. And these patients are at high risk for having a secondary event. Um, at least 25% of the time after you put the ICD in, they're going to fire again, meaning that they would have a significant cardiac event if they didn't have their ICD in. So that's a comment. So they would get that. I think the next question, part of the question though, is um, anti-inflammatory therapy, which is the algorithm here. And many of you voted to just give corticosteroids alone. Uh, I'm more and more inclined to give corticosteroids plus methotrexate up front rather than waiting to see how they have more morbidity. Dominic, what's your uh, approach now to cardiac sarcoid? Yeah. Yes, um, I, I would have treated like that. Sometimes when people is uh, older, I um, begin methotrexate as well like as corticosteroid, so as to decrease corticosteroid uh, sooner. But as a gen for general cases, I will do the same, the A, B, C, responses, but I tend, because I know that uh, uh, cardiac sarcoidosis is often chronic and need a treatment for a long time, but there is no uh, evidence to do that, but often I initiate, I start methotrexate soon. <laughs> we should take advantage of this, Peter, because you've got in a case that has uh, two issues that came up, uh, some of the chat questions. One was the PET scan versus the MRI. You have a nice example of a positive MRI. And the current uh, definitions developed by the uh, heart rhythm people and by the Wausau people is that a positive MRI in a patient with known sarcoidosis would be sufficient for cardiac diagnosis. However, in this patient with non-known sarcoidosis and you didn't identify a granuloma, that's one of the issues. So that's where the myocardial biopsy is, I think, important. But you have to realize that only in 40% of patients with cardiac sarcoid is a biopsy positive. So you may miss it, and they still have cardiac sarcoid. Yeah. I agree. So um, I'm going to go to the case. Um, the additional workup was really exhaustive, um, but she didn't have any additional disease manifestation, no pulmonary, no ophthalmic manifestation, no skin no other condition. And um, the first time she um, attended my clinic was actually in April of 2020 with the inability to taper down steroids. She had a relapse and an uh, additional event uh, with the ICD for um, cardiac disease. Um, and um, at this point, which steroid sparing agent would you start? Um, and that was the question I was posed. We already discussed, but you may have other choices than I did. So please choose no add-on immunosuppressive therapy, A. 
methotrexate answer B, azathioprine answer C, infliximab or upon cyclophosphamide answer E, please cast your vote. Okay, the great majority with 91% is uh, choosing methotrexate and that was at this point in time also my choice and I agree with it. And uh, as we discussed, many would choose methotrexate altogether with glucocorticoids at first diagnosis and um, because treatment is um, relatively long and may need a couple of years. Um, so, but... Um, as a thioprine would be a reasonable choice according to the algorithm as, as well, but uh, we are more familiar with methotrexate and the patient tolerated methotrexate uh, fairly well. So uh, methotrexate and I think as a thioprine are both um, reasonable choices for cardiac disease at this point in time. Uh, you didn't talk about the dose of steroids that you gave this patient on. Ah, um, I started with one milligram per kilogram of body weight and then tapered down for, uh, yeah, she was like half a year, um, but she needed uh, additional doses of um, glucocorticoids, but my starting dose would be one milligram per kilogram body weight. And you, Bob, what dose? Yeah. This, this was a uh, source of much controversy because the Japanese had published a study showing that higher dose corticosteroids, uh, once you got above 30 milligrams, uh, absolute dose didn't make any difference, but had more toxicity, at least their impact on the ejection fraction. So I'm inclined nowadays for cardiac sarcoid to start at 20 or 30 milligrams, um, rather than going that high of a dose. With the exception being neurosarcoidosis, where I give uh, that high doses. How about you, Dominic? Uh, I think it's a very nice question because uh, several people asks this question, what dose to use according to organs? And uh, we can see after our work in the task force that we lack uh, evidence-based studies to determine the correct dose. It was shown in a retrospective British study that uh, renal sarcoidosis could respond to half milligram kilo and not one milligram kilo. It was not better that one, not, uh, uh, not uh, um, less efficient than one milligram kilo. So probably in many cases, we use the dose because we are feared of the pathology, but it's not sure that it's necessary. I don't know what is your opinion. Well, I think there's a nice study by the Dutch who just looked at uh, this was pulmonary, not cardiac, but I think we can wonder a bit. And they showed that the higher the dose, um, once you got above 20 milligrams, there was no improvement, but there was much more toxicity. In that case, they used weight gain. So if you looked at the force vital capacity in patients treated with corticosteroids, 20 milligrams was the maximum dose that showed any improvement beyond that. These are absolute doses. So I think that for many aspects of sarcoidosis, 20 milligrams was probably an adequate starting dose. But we were not able to make a grade recommendation, nor in the committee were we able to make enough of a consensus to make a comment. So that's where why this is left it as, a, as your individual preferences. Okay, just to follow up with the patient, she's I, in, I saw her recently a couple of days ago, she's in stable remith, uh, remission now without any use of glucocorticoids with uh, methotrexate alone. So she's doing fairly well now. Good. Another point interesting is the delay with highest dose. And uh, as shown by uh, our friends from uh, the Netherlands, it was shown that after one month, often we have a complete response. So we can decrease the dose at one month. And uh, we observe the same thing for renal sarcoidosis. Uh, uh, um, the response is obtained at one month and we can decrease the treatment at, at one month. So we can decrease the total corticosteroid dose of the patient. Okay. 
I think that's an important point. The question on when to taper down if you if you need to use it for four weeks, eight weeks, twelve weeks, and then taper down, or when to start tapering. Well, but you've nicely answered that, that issue as well. So, okay, I'm going to go to the last case um, I want to present. It's a 54-year-old female patient. She presented to a different hospital and um, actually to the neurology department in December of 2015 with headache, double vision, cerebellar ataxia, and um, uh, on the um, lumbar puncture, she showed pleocytosis, and the um, um, MRI of the of the, of the um, uh, brain showed in meningitis. She was treated with uh, prednisone at a different hospital. She improved slightly with her symptoms, but then in a um, couple of months later, she she had progressive symptoms with tetraparesis and uh, paresis of the abducens nerve. And um, the question now is, which steroid sparing agent would you start at this point in time? And um, you have infliximab, mycophenolate, acethioprine, methotrexate, or intravenous immunoglobulins as options here, because the patient had already been treated with glucocorticoids, which we agree is first-line treatment for neurosarcoid. And um, please cast your vote. A couple of that to make a choice. Okay, and 46% of all attendees chose methotrexate as the first line treatment. Dominique and Bob, how would you treat a patient at this, at this point? I think I would have uh, prescribed the methotrexate first. This is um, difficult. In the US, I couldn't get the patient infliximab until I gave them infliximab to methotrexate, but my preference would actually be to give this patient infliximab because they're progressing badly. And uh, what I do in practice to get around my insurance companies is I give them methotrexate and have them come back two weeks later and say they failed methotrexate and start them on infliximab because infliximab is gonna work quickly. It, uh, often it will work within two to four weeks and you really wanna start decompressing that nerve that's being pressed. So, Although the algorithm has methotrexate and then goes to infliximab, I think that uh, somebody who has this worsening progressive disease and you have a fear that you're never going to recover the fair, uh, leg movement, that you would go to infliximab sooner rather than later. Okay, I'm going to let you know what... Um, well, I post here methotrexate as the first choice based on our recommendations, but I I'm, I'm agree that infliximab has a strong role in neurosarcoidosis now um, due to relatively little toxicity. And um, uh, But this patient, she was treated with SSIOPRIN uh, a um, couple of years back, see 2016. Uh, no great recommendations were made by the panel, by the task force. So... Um, and then uh, she had slowly progressive disease. And um, when she came to my attention, she was unable to walk and she had already been switched to uh, mycophenolate actually over methotrexate, which was interesting. And um, uh, she improved only slightly. And when I saw her, she was uh, using a wheelchair, not able to walk. And she had gained a lot of weight because she had received um, a couple of prednisone pulses, method prednisone pulses uh, intravenously, which um, seemed to help, but she had developed secondary fibromyalgia. And um, she's still mobile in as of February 2020. So the next question would be, which therapy would you choose now, infliximab or cyclophosphamide? So 90% of you would choose infliximab and um, we did this as well and um, she's doing fairly well now. I saw her actually this morning for her infliximab infusion and she's um, able to walk again and um, kind of leading an independent life and um, uh, was able to taper down steroid. She's not asymptomatic. She has chronic disease, double vision, still headache. Um, but she's uh, able to walk actually with the infliximab infusion and she's tolerating the treatment fairly well. 
So thank you. Um, these were the cases I wanted to present you. And now I think we have time to discuss uh, a couple of those questions uh, that were addressed in the chat. Yes, there are many very interesting questions. I uh, fear that we, could, we will not have sufficient time. The first one, perhaps for Bob, what is a, ma a major pulmonary involvement? How do you recognize a major pulmonary involvement? Well, I, as I said, this is all in the eyes of the beholder in some ways. Uh, we do have markers now that if they have fibrosis and they do have, um, that you want to try to get those patients. And we know that those patients with pulmonary fibrosis about 70 or 80% of the time will still have a positive PET scan. And a study published by your group, Dominique, showed that these patients, at least a third of them will get better even if they look like they have end-stage honeycomb. And so patients with extensive lung disease, that's a major impairment. I think patients with, um, there was a question about ground glass, and um, that would be something that I would consider. I think also it's important that their vital capacity is below 70% or their DLCO is below 60%. These are also markers that we think of in looking for reversibility. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bob. There are three questions about inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, do you use them? I think that inhaled corticosteroids are maybe useful for cough. We did a double-blind placebo-controlled trial of this in the past, um, and but that's about it. I, I would actually want to know your, the European experience, Dominic, is that because we can't get high-dose budesonide, which seems to be a little bit more effective than the, the dosage we can get in the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, there is another question on uh, treating uh, patients with an obstructive syndrome. I think if FAV1 is very low, uh, um, inhaled corticosteroids will not be sufficiently efficient. So we have to use a systemic, systemic treatment. Uh, there are many questions for corticosteroids on the duration of the treatment. Uh, on initial doses, but we discussed about that. And uh, uh, also about the treatment of relapses. Do we use steroids again? Well, uh, I'll start with that one, but actually I'd like to, my approach is to tell patients, once we start steroids, you're gonna be on for at least a year or two. Not necessarily the same treatment, and that's the same dose, but it's very unlikely that I can stop treatment within the first year. Once we've made that decision, trust that Rubicon made that decision. And so uh, that may be immunosuppressives, uh, switching over from steroids or may not be. Uh, as far as what happens when they relapse, usually uh, depends on what they get relapsed from. If they were on methotrexate, we stopped it and they get relapsed and I put them back on methotrexate. If they're being tapered off steroids, they relapse, I up the prednisone and then following the algorithm, then I would add the next drug, whether that be a cytotoxic or whether that would be um, something like infliximab. There was also a question about azathioprine. Is there still any room for azathioprine? Uh, I, can, I can try to answer this question. Uh, there is a recent study from Sweden who, which confirms that uh, infections are more frequent with azathioprine than with methotrexate. Uh, the benefit is probably very near, but probably there are more adverse events, particularly infections with azathioprine. What is your opinion? Well, I agree. When we originally looked at Starting these type of drugs, we started with methotrexate because we were afraid of the infections, the malignancy issue uh, with azathioprine. The ophthalmologists have seen the same thing. And then there's the young Grutus group that showed, uh, compared to Wim Wuth, that they had a higher rate of infection on those on azathioprine. Peter, what do the rheumatologists think about azathioprine now? It's a, a well, azathioprine, we use it for um, a lot of conditions, especially um, connective tissue diseases like lupus um, or other uh, myositis. And it's um, pretty well tolerated and usually effective in those conditions. And um, similar toxicity 
um, for lab tests like um, blood counts and liver function tests compared to methotrexate. Um, but I see a couple of patients who early on develop toxicity um, secondary to acetylopin, uh, like liver function tests, elevation, and um, um, uh, leukocytopenia, which is more frequent with, um, met, um, with um, acetylopin than with methotrexate, in my opinion. But um, um, patients who develop severe nausea, vomiting with methotrexate, they um, fairly well um, tolerate uh, acetylopin. Another indication is perhaps when you have pe uh, uh, patients with uncertain contraceptions, because it's less dangerous as a than and methotrexate for childbearing or even for males, I think. So when I am not sure at all, uh, yeah. I prefer to propose uh, azathioprine. I mean, it's from the transplant literature that the, other than smaller babies in a higher spontaneous world. They don't have the malformations that you see with methotrexate. Yes, okay. Yeah, for males, I think there are um, some safety data, at least from the rheumatology world, uh, that methotrexate is safe in males um, if they want to um, have children still. So the toxicity is for women or for the, for the children uh, is fairly low. But for women uh, having to be in treated, um, acetylopin would be preferable, absolutely. Uh, there are some, uh, we, a question for Peter, uh, perhaps um, different persons uh, ask the questions, uh, what about the bone, what about the eye, <laughs> etc. cetera. Uh, um, why we did not develop about these organs? First of all, a bone and um... Um, articular sarcoidosis are not as common as pulmonary skin and lymph nodes, but we have a couple of patients with exclusive bone sarcoidosis with granulomas on, on the biopsy, but you can tell really um, based on the imaging, MRI or PET scan, if, if it's secondary to sarcoidosis, which, uh, because it looks like a metastatic disease, so you probably need a biopsy for, for bone sarcoidosis. Um, and was the question related to treatment or to diagnosis? Diagnosis? Mm -hmm. Okay, it was about both diagnosis and treatment. Yeah. So. Treatment is difficult to answer because there are no, no prospective studies on that. I would um, I go, um, I would take the user approach with glucocorticoids first and then add some steroid sparing agent if they need to. And depending on the symptoms. Another yeah, we published a series of uh, over 60 patients treated for bone disease at our place. Um, and about half of them actually don't have any symptoms that need therapy. And so yeah. like we're talking about these other treatments, I think the general algorithm that we proposed, but we tend to try to quickly get off steroids in our series. Uh, patients did better with cytotoxic and infliximab because of the osteoporosis of long-term steroid use. So if they're symptomatic, we try to get away from pregnancy and quickly as we can. And the question for both, do you tra how treat hypercalciuria? Pardon? Which how one? treat increased calciuria? Calciuria, ah, calcium. Yes, calcium uh, in urine. Yeah, yeah. So ca increased calcium in the urine, I always look for. Uh, the first thing you do is make sure they're not taking any vitamin D. The second thing you do is you check their vitamin D125 or calcitriol level because that's usually the problem in sarcoidosis that they have too much of that. About 10% will have hyperparathyroidism. And then as far as treatment goes, if you have that problem of high 125, high calcitriol, then you treat with anti-inflammatories. Usually plaquenil hydroxychloroquine is your first choice and then going down the other one. Uh, a question about antifibrotics in lung disease. I have a conflict of interest. I cannot answer this question. <laughs> I have a somewhat uh, conflict because we just finished our trial of um, profinidone that we presented at the ATS. Where we were, it was a small study. We're not able to show much difference between that and placebo. The uh, natinidab data showed that there was perhaps a benefit for, again, a small number of patients with sarcoid. 
I think that the jury is still out of where I attack products, but uh, it is something that needs to be further studied for those patients who have progressive fibrosis. Uh, a very interesting question about uh, our opinion on the use of corticosteroid in obesity. In which yes. one? In patients with obesity. Obesity, oh. Yes, taper down quickly and add cytotoxic drugs up front. Also with inpatients, older patients uh, with diabetes, hypertension, which can really worsen with glucocorticoids, it's reasonable to add a methotrexate or some other cytotoxic drug up front. Yeah, I think this is, this is an important question because uh, point of fact, the patients, it's not uncommon for them to gain 20 to 30 pounds or more. In one of our trials, the average weight gain was 40 pounds, of, uh, and that's part of the reason why you want to start a lower doses and move on. So, but I don't think it should be an absolute contraindication because we really, unfortunately, the other drugs like methotrexate just take too long to kick in. So a patient who's symptomatic, start with steroids, but you may want to add that cytotoxic agent much sooner. And another question for Bob. On methotrexate, how often you monitor uh, liver tests? All right, well, um, Peter can give his side from the rheumatology. What we do is we do it every three months. Uh, but we use a lower dose. We use 10 milligrams a day, a week, even 10 milligrams once a week. So we don't use as high as because we did see a lot more problem with leukopenia. If we follow our regimen, we published a paper, uh, a large number of patients followed over 600 patients on methotrexate for sarcoid. We do it every six, every three months. You don't really usually run into problems. A question: Can you give just methotrexate on its own? <laughs> I, I do. Yes, you, I do you, it sometimes when you have mm. uh, con severe contraindications for steroids, and often it works well. But we lack uh, studies. But I think there is an ongoing study in the Netherlands to to evaluate. Um, the, uh, the met methotrexate versus uh, corticosteroid as, as a first treatment. Yeah, it just takes longer to, for the methotrexate to, to take its effect, like eight to 12 weeks. You have to wait and educate the patient. Yes. But you can, of course, start without steroids. Well, as I mentioned, the... you mentioned people with eye disease will just go with topical steroids and start methotrexate. Cardiac disease, your case, if they hadn't had an ejection fraction of less than 40%, I would have probably treated with just methotrexate alone for the arrhythmias because you've got the defibrillator in and the arrhythmics, they may not have a problem. You may be able to get away with waiting for methotrexate. So I think it's an individual decision. Another question, interesting. Uh, how to differentiate sarcoidosis, sarcoidosis lung progression from uh, methotrexate-induced uh, lung disease. Uh, I think it's exceptional. I only, I have only seen one case with a methotrexate-induced lung-induced uh, lung disease with sarcoidosis on uh, among uh, several uh, hundred patients with methotrexate. I, I don't know your experience, but it's very, 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 very rare. And I think it's easy to differentiate because often methotrexate lung disease is very acute. Uh, and uh, the presentation is quite different uh, on imaging than sarcoidosis. I think um, it's, it's not difficult to, to make the difference. Your opinion? Yes, you have to differentiate between acute pneumonitis secondary to methotrexate, which is, as you say, an acute illness. Patients are severely ill and often require admission to the ICU. And uh, chronic progressive pulmonary fibrosis. We have a lot of data now from uh, court studies in uh, rheumatoid arthritis-related lung disease that they actually do better with methotrexate and develop less ILD, secondary to rheumatoid arthritis. So I think progressive pulmonary disease with methotrexate is an exception, as you said. Yeah, this is something that uh, we obviously have looked at over the many years since we started methotrexate. 
Um, and um, cough is usually the first symptom I see of methotrexate. And it's only a few patients that have an unexplained cough that really doesn't seem to make any sense. And that would heighten my awareness. It used to be a much bigger problem for me because I had no other alternatives, but with azathioprine, uh, lefunamide, and mycophenolate, if there's any question in my mind, I'll just switch to another uh, immunosuppressive. And usually if it's from the methotrexate, the cough goes away. But as Dominic says, this is pretty rare. And I've only actually had one patient who had biopsy confirmed methotrexate pneumonitis. And the rest of them had only been probably their sarcoid. 